Hi. Hello. How are you? I'm good. How are you, Leanne? I'm good, thank you. So, Leanne, I'd love for you to give us an introduction and also walk us through when you started dancing, your pre-professional days, and then really when it took off as a professional. Okay, so I started dancing when I was about five years old. You know, like most little girls, they um, either go to kind of ballet or gymnastics or horse riding <laughs> or something, and mine was ballet. Um, and I loved it from the offset. Um, I just loved moving. Um, I did all sorts of dancing. I did jazz and tap as well. Um, and then when I was 11, like 10, 11 years old, I auditioned for the Royal Ballet School mm -hmm. and I got a place there. So I went away to boarding school when I was 11. Wow. Um, yeah. And studied for five years at the lower school and then went to the upper school. And then I got my job in the Royal Ballet Company when I was 18. And I danced with the Royal Ballet for 12 years. And then this amazing opportunity arose. Um, Christopher Wilden was in London making Alice in Wonderland. And um, he just, um, he actually approached me on social media and um, <laughs> over Facebook and just said, oh, I heard you used to sing in the choir at school. Would you like to audition for me? And I didn't didn't exactly know what I was auditioning for at the time um but it turned out to be a Broadway show <laughs> and yeah so I took first of all I took a year's sabbatical from the company because I always thought I would would go back um but I had such a wonderful time um being in an American in Paris and being in New York and on Broadway and then knowing that the show was going to continue and come back to London and do the West End I decided to kind of hang up my ballet shoes obviously I still wear my ballet shoes in the show but um yeah so I I um left the Royal Ballet and I'm now a freelance dancer um and teacher actually I'm actually on the teacher's training course with the Royal Ballet School at the moment so yeah wanting to try and pass on as much knowledge as I possibly can um I have a real passion for that kind of crossover between ballet and musical theatre. Um, so to help as many people as I possibly can to do that crossover, because it is a really magical one to, yeah. to do. And it's not one that we hear about often. It's the, you know, the, the true ballet route into Broadway. I think we hear about less often than when a dancer is maybe either more into musical theater from the start or jazz, or maybe they're more like a commercial dancer. Um, mm -hmm. So it must have been a bit of a, like a leap of faith for you know, lack of a better phrase when you decided to like go on that audition. Was that nerve wracking? Terrifying. Well, mainly terrifying because, you know, obviously as a ballet dancer, you're silent on stage and to suddenly have a voice um, to speak, to sing uh, was really quite scary. And um, it's obviously ba dancing is a vulnerability because you're kind of expressing yourself. But to express yourself with your voice feels a whole nother level of vulnerable to me, probably not to it would feel quite the opposite to an actor. Um, yeah. If they suddenly had to express themselves through their body, through dance, it would feel this, they'd feel very vulnerable. But for me to suddenly have my voice out there, um, felt, I felt very vulnerable on stage. The, mm -hmm. um, for a good, a good year, I'd say. <laughs> it took a long time to kind of build my confidence in that. And, and still, still now, um, even like even doing something like this sometimes is a bit scary, you know, to, to actually huh. put yourself out there and, and speak um, is a little bit scary when your whole life you've been a silent performer. <laughs> yeah, I think that's so interesting. And that's what, in my opinion, one of the things that makes dance so unique is that our need to have to speak and express so much without speaking at all. And I love, mm -hmm. um, I love learning from you about how, that was a major challenge to go from that world to then, you know, on the Broadway stage and using your voice and having to really muster up and I guess learn that confidence and still challenging yourself every day. I think a lot of dancers, younger dancers need to hear that even doing something like this. Even for me, I do these every week and I'm not gonna lie, like it's at, at the, you know, at 12.59, I get a little bit nervous myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And it's the same for me now with teaching, you know, to stand up there in front of students and um, have the confidence that I 
do kind of know what I'm talking about, but to actually put it out there to them and for them to trust me, um, you know, trust me with their training. I find that quite nerve wracking as well. But, um, you know, every time you do it, you get better and you learn more, even you learn from your mistakes as well. So, um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just the whole thing is a, is a huge learning curve and it's an exciting one as well. I think that's, for me, one of the, the most exciting things in life in general is to never stop learning and to just be curious about everything um, yeah. and just embrace anything that comes your way. Yeah, I also feel that way, even just in the dietetics world and always coming to terms with that as much as I been through with school and degrees or whatever I still don't even know nearly half of what I want to know mm -hmm. and I probably the same for you as an artist and I'm curious how it was 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 it your first time in New York when you moved for an American in Paris I'd been on on vacation before yeah. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. different my first ever trip to New York actually was when I was at school at the Royal Valley School we happened to do an exchange with ABT2 Oh. And um, so ABT2 came to London, we came to New York, and um, we did a couple of performances there. Uh, and then I'd been on vacation, actually the first Broadway show I ever saw was uh, West Side Story at the Palace oh. Theatre, mm -hmm. which happened to be the theatre that I then later got to make my Broadway debut in. It was, I, I mean, the thought of the you know, I would never have thought that sat there. You know, I yes. queued up my tickets at TKTS to get, you know, <laughs> yeah. the best tickets I possibly could that afternoon. And um, and then to think, you know, years later down the line that I would actually be on that stage. I just, well, it was just never even in my kind of thoughts that that would happen. Um, so yeah, I love New York. I, I, I can't wait to come back and visit again when, when you let us Brits back in. We're not allowed <laughs> in at the moment. <laughs> um, was there ever a time that you decided to connect what you were eating was going to impact you? Like when did nutrition ever come into play for you? It came in actually massively in New York mm -hmm. because doing eight shows a week is incredibly strenuous on the body. Of course, being in the Royal Ballet, you know, you is incredibly strenuous as well, but you're not generally, you don't perform eight times a week. It's probably five max because we mm -hmm. would alternate with the opera. So to suddenly be doing eight a week, my, um, it very much became, I had to plan, especially on double show days, very carefully. It wasn't even so much what I was eating, it was when I was eating, mm -hmm. um, but get, to get the timings right and hydration as well especially in the summer months in New York, because it was so hot there. I wasn't used to that heat at all. So hydration was a massive thing for me um, and getting my timings right on a double show day particularly. But I would always eat after a show. My biggest meal would always, well, I'd always have a quite a large breakfast and then a more of a kind of light snack kind of before the show and then I'd eat after the show. Yeah, it's so interesting. That's one thing that I work on with a lot of the dancers that work with me is how dancers, just because the nature of the activity, can't be 100% intuitive with like how we're eating, not have to have like more of a proactive approach. And so often mm -hmm. that involves the timing and understanding like how, what foods work for what dancer, like before class, you know, yeah. and, if you're changing your point shoes, how to have a snack, and then of course recovery. So I think it's so interesting, especially that it was kind of um, like thrown onto you when you came to New York, eight shows a week, extremely strenuous on the body and probably also mentally just to make sure you're, you know, not feeling burnt out and making sure you're fueling yourself. Mm -hmm. I'd always make sure I had snacks in the dressing room. I never, during the show, I never get a chance to go back to the dressing room, but mm -hmm. during the interval or intermission, um, I'd always make sure I had something. So I knew I had enough left to get to that ballet right at the end. Cause the biggest dancing part is right at the end of the show. Mm -hmm. um, so I always had to make sure that I had an, enough in me um, to, to get to that moment, especially on that double show day. Sure, oh gosh. Yeah. I can't even imagine how strenuous a double show day is. <laughs> yeah, it was it was quite tough actually. The the hard thing was um, we do Friday double Saturday and a Sunday matinee. Having yeah. four in such a short space of time was pretty tough. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And getting, getting that recovery in, like that recovery meal, that recovery time. You have Mondays off, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We did, we did in, in, on Broadway. It's every place I've done it, it's been a slightly different schedule. Sure. Um, but having that, doing a Sunday matinee, having the whole of Monday, not being happy to be in until Tuesday evening, did give you a lot of time to kind of recover physically, um, you know, with sleep, with food, if you can try and grab a massage on the Monday um, or yeah, just to have a day to just to completely chill <laughs> was, was sure. great. Sure. Yeah. My next question really gets into a bit more of a sticky topic, but as you know, so many dancers struggle with uh, very unrealistic ideals around body image. And this is a huge struggle. I, you as a teacher, probably maybe I witnessed some of this. So I'm curious, mm -hmm. What advice does it ever come up in the dance class? Um, how have you dealt with it over your, you know, years of teaching and of even being the student? Yeah, I, I've had some moments um, in my time. I do, I do think things are changing. Yeah, I, there's definitely um, been well. This course that I'm on with the Royal Ballet School, I know they're addressing it hugely and the nutritional advice for the students is fantastic yeah and they really not only nutritional advice but the kind of the support yeah the, the mental side of it as well you know making sure they're as stable as they possibly can be in their relationship with food that emotional relationship that they may have as well I know they are addressing that and I know they're really trying to help yeah um, all the students kind of put in good practice right from the beginning but yeah, in my time, I've definitely come up with um, moments um, in my career when there's been moments that, you know, ha happen to be some of the saddest moments, you know, the, the harder moments to deal with. But um, it, it's, a, it's a really sticky, difficult subject, like you said. Um, I think it's about the support. I was just going to say the same thing. Like at the end of the day, what you're saying with what Royal Ballet is really put integrating into their education, that's what it's all about. If a dancer has strong support and knows where to go when they're having thoughts, whether those thoughts are that they don't like their body or they're very, very comparative in the mirror, whatever it is, those thoughts are going to impact them. They're going to, it's going to mm -hmm. impact their ability to concentrate in class, to, you know, succeed long-term. If they're not feeling enough, they're going to be tired. So if the, if the, um, higher ups are there to help support and bring that education. I think that is such a huge, huge benefit. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's all about the education and the support. Mm. And I, I wish, you know, in my time I'd had that because, you know, there were moments where it's, it's also the language used, like if there has to be um, something that needs to be addressed, whether sure. you're a professional dancer or a student, you know, one, it, it's gone one way or the other. It's how that language is said to you. How is it said? Because that will have a huge impact on how you as a dancer will address that situation. So the language and the support um, is, is a huge deal. Uh, and I also think, you know, I'm learning as a teacher um, to not use the mirror. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, we, as much as possible, we don't use the mirror. And I think that's great for dancers to one, not compare themselves, two, not be only looking for their faults, because generally that's what we do with the mirror, isn't it? We don't look for what's good, we look for what's bad. Mm -hmm. We're taught to constantly be giving ourselves feedback. What can I make better? What can, what can I do with this? What can I do with that? If the mirror's not there, it's about how you feel. Yeah. And the, at the end of the day, that's what you're putting onto stage is how you feel. You're gonna not have a mirror to reflect back to you. The only thing that's gonna reflect back to you is the audience's reaction. So, it's about what it feels like and do you feel good in your body and and i think that's a really important thing yeah and do you feel confident you know i yeah. so true we all know we're not going to have mirrors when we get to the stage um but i've never heard it from that perspective in regards to uh only dancers unfortunately only focusing on their faults and not what they're actually doing really well and I think that unfortunately is like a way of the culture um so having uh, you know mm -hmm. teachers teachers like you and you starting to pave the way for um actually bringing in that positive reinforcement yes. not negative reinforcement 
is so mm -hmm. helpful for a dancer's confidence, you know, to build that framework from a young age. My next question for you is, you know, dancers really tend to hyper focus on their art. How mm -hmm. did you and how do you just keep balance? Well, obviously now you're a mom, so you've got a lot going on. Yeah, there's quite a lot going on at the moment. Uh, just keeping a balance just generally with life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been, I've always felt when I've come home, I leave dancer Leanne behind. Yeah. Like when I close that door. Um, and it's the same because my husband's a dancer as well. And we've kind of always had that rule that when the door closes, we're Leanne and Paul, we're not so-and-so of the Royal Ballet or so-and-so from American in Paris to just be, I just, I love being a normal person. And I don't know what I even mean by that. Like, I love going to the supermarket. I love putting the washing out on the line. I just like, I really enjoy doing normal things. Um, so it's, and just kind of being with family, being with my parents, being with my brother and his wife and his children and my my husband's family. It's so important to just, you know, we hype, the ballet world is wonderful, but we hype it up to such a high level and we, we make it everything, it's absolutely everything. I have to go to bed early because I have a show tomorrow. <laughs> I have to eat this because I've got a show tomorrow. I have to do this. I, it becomes very, very selfish um, and to, for me it's quite important to to leave that all behind and to just kind of be a totally normal person <laughs> you know this yeah. you're, you're reminding me of just like a little personal story that I have real quick <laughs> um I had just gotten pregnant with my son and I remember being on the phone with my mom and like coming from ballet class I was walking from I was in the city walking from ballet and I was saying like oh I'm gonna figure out my schedule so that I can continue to dance when every you know um when he's born or whatever and she's like eh, you're gonna see like everything's gonna change when they come because you're not gonna be so selfish and that never fully hit me until I became a mom mm -hmm. absolutely no I totally agree um because it is it's a very self-absorbed well it's I, it's not self-absorbed it's it's a vocation yeah you know it's 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 a it's a it's a vocation and and if you aren't like that if you if you aren't that dedicated to it it's probably not going to happen mm. um this career so it's it's you have to have that side of your personality that you're willing to put that into it but mm. it's also great to take maybe one day a week or one evening a week to just leave dance dance a person behind and and just be you um yeah it's you know i love this world i i think it's absolutely wonderful and it's so special and the thought of like my daughter like maybe being able to watch the nutcracker from the wings one day is so so special but i also putting its perspective isn't it it's just having a little bit of perspective and I think if anything the last kind of 18 months has taught us is yeah. perspective <laughs> yeah. and I'm I'm a little curious when you were on Broadway because it is such a different I don't know if it's really it's, it's definitely different from the dance world um you probably were able to better connect maybe with your character because you had other experiences because you um maybe learned to have that perspective and like leave you know the ballerina at the door mm. well it's strange because because <laughs> the character I played was a ballerina <laughs> so I could kind of bring all that angst with me it kind of helped um <laughs> True. But there were also um you know there's moments the as far as the show is concerned you know it's set just after the second world war like the liberation of Paris yeah and trying to put yourself in their shoes you know in some ways, I mean, this sounds incredibly like dramatic, but you know, we've been um, having to isolate, haven't we? Yeah. And all having, we've almost had a curfew and had to be indoors and not allowed to see each other and to hide away. And in some ways that's given me as best a possible perspective of what it may have been like for those people that yeah. were living through the liberation in Paris. Like they ha they weren't allowed to go out and buy all sorts of food you know it was limited and I don't know what it was like in America but like you could not buy pasta at one point in in the UK because everyone was buying pasta you couldn't buy flour because everyone was making banana bread <laughs> we had like rations yeah um, so it's 
yeah, it's um, trying to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Yeah. But as far as like the ballet things goes, um, I guess because she was still a ballet dancer, I still had to bring that side of it with me. But, um, yeah, yeah is, very, very good point. Yeah, but um, definitely finding, yeah, it's great, like you say, to just be someone else for two and a half hours a day or five hours a day if you're doing a, a yeah. two show day um to kind of yeah immerse yourself into someone else's footsteps is is kind of great actually especially yeah. if she isn't when you like her if you didn't yeah. like the person you were playing maybe not so nice to be them yeah. for that long but um yeah I, I quite liked her so um yeah it was a privilege to play her <laughs> that's awesome so talk to me a little bit about motherhood and covid <laughs> Yeah, so um, I found out I was pregnant almost this time last year, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and we just, uh, we'd come out of one lockdown. We'd had a lovely, they re everyone, everything kind of went back to normal in the summer. And then, um, and then it all went a bit wrong again here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's all been a little bit crazy. But um, yeah, COVID was, uh, so I closed American in Paris in Paris on the 1st of January, 2020. And I remember wow. literally on New Year's Eve, standing on the balcony of the Chatelet Theatre, watching the Eiffel Tower wow. like glittering wow. at midnight. And we were all toasting like, the, hey, it's the 1920s. It's gonna be amazing. Uh, not the 1920s, the 2020s. And yeah. you know, we, we were all wearing like 20s dress up. It was amazing. And um, uh, thinking how wonderful it was to see in a new decade and then little did we know like a couple of weeks later yeah. it would be the way it was so I'd just finished that contract and didn't know what was going to be happening after that the only thing I did know is that I wanted to do this teacher's course sure and that was the only kind of um definite that I had that I wanted to happen that year um so yeah it was kind of crazy the lockdown um and then then I found out I was expecting B and she was born at the end of June. Mm -hmm. And um, that was kind of weird, you know, going to scans and things by myself. Um, yeah. Here, yeah. I had the same, I had the same thing. Yeah, husbands I weren't allowed in. Luckily by the time she was born, um, partners were allowed because there yeah. was quite a few months here where no partners were were allowed and I had a c-section um a plan well planned as in two days before planned <laughs> um so um and luckily he was allowed to be there and yeah it was I mean it was amazing it was one it is the most amazing experience of my life yeah. having her um I always knew I wanted to be a mum sure. for years um and it's just you know it's um happened a bit later more later on in life than I, I originally thought it would but you can't plan these things but I'm absolutely loving it and she's just though I'm great well I was uh reading who was it Megan Fairchild's um reading about her she's just finished her first season back and yeah. she had she's now has three little girls isn't mm -hmm. she? she just had twins and yes. she just said she's not um she's tired but she's tired it's it's an amazing kind of tired like she her life isn't full it's fulfilled it's yes it's, you've got it's and I, I know exactly what she means you know I yes you don't sometimes don't sleep at night but who cares because yeah. you're you know you're nursing this beautiful little baby um and I just don't know I'm like was I just really lazy and unproductive before I had a baby because <laughs> now I'm like I use every single minute like oh I know God. exactly what I'm doing there's not a moment where I'm just sat like twiddling my thumbs I'm like Damn. what did I do for all these years I just twiddle yes. my thumbs <laughs> no I totally agree I think back to like what I did I wasn't even as active like with my business before I was working in a hospital and your hours are very set when you're working in a hospital um and now I feel like every second of my day has to be like perfectly planned and I'm like what was I doing before this time it's, and you're right the, the lack of sleep you kind of just like do it you just push through when you do it and it's it's fine yeah absolutely it's it's just a complete joy I may ask me in six months time I might not say the same thing 
<laughs> so but, I was, um, I was just going to say my husband and I, we just went away for about four days without the kids. And it was like, I really did get a little burnt out. I'm not going to lie. But you know, COVID has made everything much harder, but you're in a constant state of anxiety of hopefully God forbid anybody gets sick. And mm -hmm. it's, it's really a nerve wracking time, I think, to have kids. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, whoever thought like, you'd have a baby in the pandemic. It's just, you just don't, you just don't even like, none of us imagined this would happen. Yeah. Um, but it seems like we're all coming through the other side of it now. Um, yeah. Fingers crossed anyway. It is a slightly changed world, but maybe it's changed for the better. I yeah. mean, who, who knows? Um, and hopefully, you know, all our freedoms will be back soon and we can all travel where we want to travel and see everyone we want to see. Yes, I know. And also, I guess, in some ways, it was kind of wonderful timing wise that my husband wasn't performing so much sure. so he could spend more time with us. Um, he's back at work now. Um, they have Romeo and Juliet tonight and then wow. the new Wayne McGregor tomorrow mm -hmm. the project and yeah, so that he's crazy busy now, but um, <laughs> at the beginning, it was wonderful to have that much time together. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah such a yeah. like sweet, a lot of pros, a lot of cons. Leanne, my final question for you, which I ask everybody on this show is, how would you define what it means to be the healthy dancer? Oh, goodness. Healthy, healthy, like, spans so many things, doesn't it? Like, it spans your men mental health. For me that's kind of number one because if your mental if your mental health is is good everything else hopefully will fall into place so for me confidence um feeling secure with yourself um knowing you've given everything you can possibly give all the all these things if your head is happy i think everything else is happy and you, you know, if your head is happy and you're healthy, you will eat the right things. You will make the right choices. You will look after yourself. Sometimes if we're not feeling that great up here, then we don't treat ourselves very well. Same if you're injured. If you don't feel great about yourself, sometimes you don't treat your body very well. You don't think you're worth it. So for me, a healthy health is all about here. Yes, I, yeah. I could not agree more. You know, it's, it definitely starts. We need to make sure we're taking care of our mental and emotional well-being. I think for dancers, it's so easy for us to just focus on the physical, to focus on the foods that we're eating, how it's going to help our strength and our endurance. And while all of that's important, it is even more important to make sure that we have like, you know, how we said support um, and that we are learning actual um, helpful coping mechanisms for when we're feeling stressed and you know maybe emotionally burnt out which are all very common for dancers so I really? thank you yeah I thank you so much for that advice that was wonderful oh thank you no thank you for having me thanks of for asking course.